It's a pleasure of mine to have a guy that I've known for a long time. The minute I walked on Spalding Field, I battled with this dude. <laughs> talked about Watts. I talked about Houston, but there was a mutual respect from day one because I loved his football IQ and what he meant to our programs. I got James Washington on this version of Chopping It Up, and we got to chop it up with Buck, and we got to say J-Dub is what we all call him. <laughs> Any nicknames, but Dub, glad to have you on, man. We've been trying to do this for a while. You know what, though, man? I, I, I got to say this to you because, you, you know, I, I had a little babies. I had my babies. My babies from Texas. I had some dudes from all over the place, Oklahoma. Um, and you was one of those dudes who stepped in, and you knew you belonged. You know, we had a winning culture there. Um, don't know why. I mean, most of us went and played in the league, but we couldn't win a national championship. I don't know how that worked. <laughs> we won Super Bowl, but we couldn't win national championships. How that worked? But when you came out, man, you just added, you was that type of ingredients. You know, it was my senior year, um, and I remember you as a, as a young pup stepping on a big campus, coming to California, leaving Texas. And, and, and see, I didn't realize how big football was you know, being drafted in Los Angeles. So I never really loved yeah. left Los Angeles at the time. But when I went down to Dallas and I'm sitting in the airport in the off season <laughs> and they're showing high school football, I said, boy, this is big time football now. You know, and yeah. I'm in a city kid. And when you stepped on, the, you stepped on Spalding Field like you belong. Yeah. And, and it wasn't like, okay, let me get my feet wet. You know, you know, guys, some guys step in and they kind of kind of pedal around. But yeah. what I remember about you stepping on and you would not back down from me. And I, and, and, I, and I wasn't the easiest person to get along with back then. You know, and I'm well, aggressive. I, and you did not I, back down. And that's where you got my respect from, bro. Well, let, let me tell you how that happened, too, because I was always taught as a young guy I would be quiet. And I talk. But somebody told me when I was really young, you got to go to the guy that's the toughest one. You always do. And it was either going to be you, Ken Norton, yeah. or Carnell Lake. I mean, our defense. We had some dudes now. <laughs> Damn Craig Rutledge. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Craig, Craig, Craig Rutledge. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I'm going to say what I want to say, man. Yeah, you know about the coldest white boy that I've ever played with? You told and, me that. And, and I played with Bill. Wait, hold on. I played with Bill Bates. Gotcha. Okay? And, he, and he's at that level. But Craig Rutledge is probably one of the unsigned heroes of our time as far as leadership. He, he didn't get a chance to go play at the next level. And he's probably the only dude that in our secondary, and this is when I say reverse racism, is this dude was a playmaker, he was a leader, and he was a student of the game. Just like all the other dudes that was in that secondary that played on Sunday, and, and guys always ask me this question, what guy played with you that should have played on Sunday that did not have a chance? And without a doubt, Craig Rutledge hands, and I played with a lot of guys. Yeah. Craig Rutledge hands over a lot of dudes that I played with should have played on Sunday. Doug, let's go back to, you know, you mentioned it, and, and we'll talk about Texas. Because I got, I mean, we, we could probably do this, man. We do <laughs> way <laughs> but this is why i wanted to do it with you yeah. Going back to watts growing up you were raised by your grandfather eddie alexander yeah. you, and i know the story your mom and dad weren't always present in your life but but your grandfather was yeah. and i love the story about him punching you in the chest and knocking you out of the car um you know I was the only child and, um, mm -hmm. you know, I was part of the system for a while. Then they came and took it and became my legal guardians, uh, my grandmother and grandfather. And I remember one day they had just opened up the, this place called the Hearthstone Mall. And, you know, I had sticky fingers when I was little, you know, <laughs> I was fast and I had sticky fingers. And every time I walked by something, it seemed to stick to my hands. And then I walk out the store. You were, grow, you were growing up to be a DB. You were growing to be a DB. <laughs> sticky fingers, man. It's just... And, and because I was so fast, I always did something with people who were slow so, and that I could beat up. So the whole point was I got caught. 
and um, and I had a I had money in my pocket, but th this particular situation, we in the store, and I got caught. And the only person that I've ever been afraid of in my entire life is Eddie Alexander. I mean, it, there's Eddie Alexander, then there's God at that point in time when I was young, because that's all I knew. And I got caught shoplifting. And he came down to the police station to pick me up. And, and he says, I'm gonna give you two choices. And before I was able, I turned, we was in one of those old Chevy pickup trucks, like with the buck, with the buck seats, the long bench seats. <laughs> yeah. And I turned to the left to answer the question. And you know, my grandfather was five foot, five foot five from Mississippi. I mean, when I say five foot tall, five foot wide, and he had hands and he worked in, in the steel mill. So he had them hard hands. Man, he hit me in the chest. And, and unfortunately, when you're in the bucket seat, you ain't got no seat belt on. And when I turned to look at him to answer the question, he hit me so hard. Man, for 10 years, I had, a, I had the door out plant on, on my back. That's how hard he hit me. From that day on, bro, even to this day, when I walk in the supermarket, you know they had a little loose candy, and I look <laughs> at the loose candy to eat, my back start hurt. <laughs> I mean, he, he really hit me and said, guess what? If you have to steal, just come to me. Mm -hmm. He said, I might not be able to give it to you that day, but just come to me. First of all, don't embarrass me, and don't embarrass your grandmother because everything that we're trying to do for you. Yeah. And that's the kind of love. He never kissed me once, never said I love you once. It was a tough love situation. Yeah. And I'm very proud that he, um, you know, he poured, poured what, he, what he had into mm -hmm. me, you know. Um, when you're raised by your grandparents, you know, you kind of, they just kind of watch you. But yeah. he, he could never show the, the love and the passion of, like, kissing you or hugging you like I do, you know, did my kids. Um, but what he did teach me is how to be a man and how to do the right things, you know? And that's, that's what I, well, I remember when he passed away my first year in Dallas, you know, um, the dude is so honorary, man. He, he waited for me to fly back to go to, um, to see him in the hospital. Mm. And as soon as I kissed him on the forehead and told him that I, I got his wife, meaning my grandmother, I said, I got him. He was, Go, he went, he had a, so honorary, man. He had a laundry list on his deathbed. Mm -hmm. This is what I need you to do. Boom, 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 boom. And he just fell asleep. Wow. Wow. Yeah, just fell asleep right that, there. That's, that's, that's <laughs> like really, I, yeah. yeah. He really seemed to step in for you. And it seems like that's, that was a trend when, you know, when you and I talk, but you, you know, you look at your story, Henry Washington, who was also your coach. In high school, mentor, but he was hard on you, and I and I think Doug, you needed that. You even said, <laughs> no, I mean, why, just, "Why everybody oh, think I need tough love, man? Not tough why love? Why do I need? Do I look like a dude that needs tough love? I don't need no tough love. No, no but you, you you need to respect people. <laughs> yes, I that's do. what I mean. I now, I, maybe it's not tough love, but for you, what I always found about you is if you respect somebody, you'll you'll go, you'll ride or die with them. Ride or die, you're right. And, and, and that's the thing when I read about Henry Washington, because I used to work out, I'd go out in the summers and work out at LA Southwest College. So I didn't know you were out there running track with him. Oh, and yeah. Like, wow. So how did he influence your life and take over in the place of what Eddie Alexander uh, provided for you? Um, man, the same situation, man. It was, um, and he's, he is my father. I mean, okay. I don't care what nobody say, you know, biologically not biologically he had stepped in um even during the time with my grandfather he you know i was a baseball player and my grandfather never watched one of my football games never seen me play live um because i decided to play football instead of playing baseball and um but coach washington stepped in my life after i got in some trouble again i mean it always seemed that i was in some kind of trouble. Um, <laughs> Coach Washington stepped in my life, and I got into a fight in the locker room. Um, I wasn't on the football team yet, um, just like PE, and mm -hmm. we, we we had we had some money issues, and 
got into a, a scuffle with this dude. Um, and, and the dude, Coach Washington, he actually tried to break up the fight. And, and the dude knew he, it was good timing because the dude swung on me. And mm-hmm. caught me, caught me like like on the side of my face, right? While Coach Washington was there, as he was coming to break the fight up, the dude, I'm looking at Coach, and he wow, got mm-hmm. me, right? And I'm like, okay, okay. And Coach Washington, he was a none nonsense, he was a no nonsense type dude, and he was like, you ain't gonna do this in my locker room, blah blah blah. Anybody like, bro, this belonged to the government. This ain't your locker room. It's a public <laughs> school. You know, that's me talking back. Yeah. <laughs> and um. <laughs> I say, but this dude right here, he gonna get his. He says, if you want, ever want to play football for me, I had, cause I hadn't played for him yet. You ever want to play football for me, you gonna follow orders. This is gonna stop right here. I'm like, bruh, I, I can care less. I, I say, how much you make? <laughs> you know, I, I went there with you. Oh know, man, how yeah. Much you make? He was blah, 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 blah. He said, what is that? You know, and he was using his adjectives. Um, and I'm like, um, I don't give a who, 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 who about your, um, your, um, football. He said, I heard you got talent, young man, but you will never play for me because you're not disciplined. Uh, I'm, I mean, you know, you know how I am too. Yeah. I, I'm sitting there looking at him like, I really don't care. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to beat this dude. You know, mm-hmm. for me and my homeboy, Michael Burt, my best friend who actually got me to come out and play football. I'll tell the story about that in a minute. But um, he finally, we went around the corner. Alan was going, I, I was going, and I caught him right by the, by the quad area. They could put them hands on him. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Coach, 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 Coach Washington pulls up again. He pulls up because he knew how we was rolling. But it was, it was more of a, a group thing then. And, and and we beat down um, Allen. I remember this. We beat down Allen. Coach Washington came around, and Michael Burke was already playing football. Okay. And he tried to, you know, he was like, blah blah blah. You you off the team? And I was like, sir. I, I mean, I don't really know you like that, but I'm a. That's it's, it, that's my problem. This this ain't this ain't Mike's problem. Mike just kind of identified where he was at. Mike didn't do nothing. That was just me. <laughs> And I took, the, and because I owned up, owned up to it. I don't know what happened at that point in time. He called me and said, "Hey, you come to my office tomorrow. You know, you come to the office tomorrow. You take this shit and you leave. You get this <laughs> off, my, off my yard." You know, I'm like, "Yeah." Here again, boss. This belongs to the state. This does not, you know, because yeah. you know, I, I know can hear you, you, you being a lawyer. <laughs> gotta get my last, <laughs> we gotta give my last piece in there. It belongs to the state. From that point on, man, he has been my coach, has been my mentor. He has been the father figure in my life. He has been everything, the thing that he has never done, and he has a hard time with it too. As I'm a passionate and affectionate person, he has a hard time saying I love you, just like my grandfather. And he has a hard time taking affection. And mm. matter of fact, he was just over here um, the other day, and, 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 and because I, I I know what bothers him. I don't know, Buck, if I would be the man, and you know, and, I, and everybody, I got flaws, you know, but I don't know if I would have been the man that that you were able to see when you came in as a senior, me being your mentor, um, and all the other hundreds and thousands of people that I've mentored on my life. Mm-hmm. If it wouldn't have been for him, I wouldn't have learned how to deal with people. If it wouldn't have been for him, I wouldn't have learned how to understand what the difference between the street and trying to be a professional. Yeah. You know, he taught me some skill sets, man. Matter of fact, I wouldn't even learn how to backpedal, man, because I was like one of the coldest receivers in the city. Mm-hmm. Not on a football field, but like the, the weekend. Yeah, yeah, game, I'm not, I'm the the yeah. game, like I was the coldest dude. I was boy, yeah. out there uh, with my ace bandages on, all wrapped <laughs> up. Like, and Co- 
homeless dude never played never played for, um organized tackle football <laughs> until 11th grade wow i got in trouble ended up going to do going on a little vacation for a little bit um and uh when i came home uh my po introduced me to coach and said this is a good dude he just needs some help hmm. and after that man my life has been flying you know it, it, we, we all have roller coasters but yeah i owe a lot to that man man i mean he is the dude who who put me and moved me in the right direction and he only coached me one year buck one year that's it huh? yeah this is why i'm saying be it's funny who comes in your life yeah and i tell you people come and go this this man had an impact to to this day he only coached me one year he coached my 11th grade year and then he went to um southwest after that and he just matter of fact just last year he got inducted to the junior college hall of fame here in california i drove all the way down there just to see him inducted i mean I, like i'm in southern california i drove yeah. all the way up north just to see him inducted into the uh, junior college hall of fame dub you know you, you bring up something man i don't i don't think things happen just happenstance i think god puts us in places he puts us with people Sometimes we don't always listen to them, but, but we do. Th those stories you're telling are so true and so profound. I think the other thing is you only played two years of uh, high school football, right? Your junior and senior year. Yeah, I played junior and senior year. And, yeah. and kind of, I kind of messed up my senior year a little bit. Um, but the thing that my grandfather taught me is I have to always go to school. You yeah. know, that he said, dude, you can do whatever you want. But see, my problem was not eight, to three o'clock. My problem was 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. to 8 a.m. You, know, <laughs> you know, I never slept. So it was yeah. like, I was cool because I want, like I told you, the only person that I was afraid of, I wasn't afraid of the police. I wasn't afraid of the street because, you know, I knew I had hands. Um, and I wasn't, the, it wasn't, wasn't afraid to die. It's, it's hard when you, and people will say this all the time. If you ever get to the point where you're not afraid to die, mm -hmm. it's hard to control you. It's, it's, yeah. If that's not the thing, like, you know what? I just seen people die. I just seen people get killed. I just seen all those things happen, like, right in front of me. So I'm, I wasn't afraid of those things. Mm -hmm. But Eddie Alexander was the only thing that I was afraid of. And what I was afraid of, it wasn't the physical aspect. It wasn't the five foot five foot five. It was, I don't want to disappoint him because he didn't pour it into me. Yeah. And then this other man come in, Henry Washington. I didn't want to disappoint him. So therefore, that's why I was all in. And then I'll tell you what happened in college in a little bit, but it was because I did not want to disappoint. Yeah. And I wanted to show them that I can do better. I can be better than what I was. Yeah, and that's interesting. What made you decide UCLA? Because you were in Watts, you went to Jordan High School, right in the heart of, you know, yes. that country. You know, I mean, it, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I was, I'm always shocked by this. Uh, well, check this out, man. Uh, SC is like a, a burgundy, more red color, you know. Um, <laughs> that's right. And when, um, you know, I, I, I grew up around a whole bunch of Gray Street, which is blue, Crips, and all that. Um, and then also our basketball player, Larry Friend, uh, who just passed away a couple years ago, played basketball at SC. And I didn't want to follow him. Matter of fact, the school that I was going to go to, uh, me and James Primus, we was going to go to Arizona State. We met, yeah. we met at Arizona State. All my boys, they, you, know, um, you know, Dave Fletcher, a whole bunch of dudes, that was already there, um, battles. I mean, it was so many dudes that was there. Aaron, Aaron Cox, all them yeah. dudes. That we all played in the city together. So we was gonna go to Arizona State and, and our thing was go to the Rose Bowl, right? Cause back then in California, the biggest game out here was the Rose Bowl. How do yeah. you get to the Rose Bowl? And even though UCLA was winning the Rose Bowls, like before I got there, um, they had just won the Rose Bowl. 
and everybody's talking about the powder blue. Like, oh, like, oh they soft, they soft. <laughs> and guess what? But I lived in California. Yeah, yeah. The first time that I ever stepped on UCLA campus, I live here. The first time I ever stepped on UCLA campus was on a recruiting trip. Wow. And that's like 13, 14 miles from your house. Cause 13, 13, 14 miles yeah. down the road, right? Um, I went to USC a couple times and it was just, it was just, they was just different dudes. Like they was just dudes. They was just, they had a different air about themselves. And it's so funny because most of my friends now are from SC. <laughs> you know, we got our brewing, we got our brewing, you know, our brewing mob, but most of my dudes that I hang out with out here in LA, that's it. and it's so funny. They always like, Jada, you should have I said, Man, y'all couldn't have paid me enough to come over there and play for y'all. <laughs> so, uh, and the biggest piece was having been there, everybody just thought I was gonna go to SC, you know, but you it was actually between Oklahoma, uh, Arizona State, and um, and UCLA wasn't even on the picture. It was, I wasn't even thinking about going to UCLA until I went to the recruiting trip and um, went there. I was like, ooh, and I seen Flojo. See, Flojo went to Jordan High School. That's right. She was older. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I seen Flojo uh, um, at this party, and I was like. Hmm. <laughs> you know, she had, you know, she was like Olympian, all everything. I mean, yellow bone fine is all get up, you know, coming from Watts. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to UCLA. I'm going to have Flojo. I mean, even yeah. though she, you know, <laughs> I got it. Senior, I'm a freshman, right? I ain't even a freshman yet. I'm still in high school. And that's all. That's the I went to, I chose a school because of uh, uh, a beautiful red bone. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. I really did. Nobody did I tell the real truth. <laughs> I went to UCLA because I thought I could hook up with Flojo. That is I, wild. I, nobody didn't know that, but that was my original piece. I didn't care about no football. <laughs> I'm just a knucklehead, like I can hook up with Flojo. Well, hey, man, we're going to take a quick break and come back. I, we got to follow up on that story, but we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Many people are looking for natural alternatives to help ease their aches and pains. Begin stopping the pain with the help of Pain Stopper. Formulated by healthcare providers, Pain Stopper helps alleviate a variety of physical ailments so you can get back to doing what you love. Our products are triple independently lab tested to ensure the highest quality hemp available. Visit PainStopCBD.com for more information. Pain Stopper, because why manage pain when you can stop it? How you guys doing? It's Artavis Scott here. Live it, thin energy. The reason why I like Thin Energy is because I need to be at my peak performance no matter what I do. Big sports drink for me, you know, keep it going, keeping myself up. It gets me on top of my game, extra boost that I need to keep it going in the fourth quarter. Working out, definitely a good drink for you to have. All the good nutrition that you need inside of it. Passion fruit, it's my favorite one. It's not just for professional athletes, it's for everyone. And I definitely can say it definitely works in the office or in the weight room, uh, wherever you may be. You can go to thinenergy.com, tell them I sent you, and get your drink. Thin Energy, the healthy alternative. Drink it, live it. See, if I got something like that, I can just go. No sugar, no crash. Picking up where we left off, I know uh, with Flojo was an influence, and she, she was beautiful. Everybody knew, it, but it, it was so much going on on that yard at the time. But the one thing I want to talk with you about is the, the safety tradition. Ken Easley, Don Rogers. I've never. I mean, I know you can hit. I know e ET. I want to win against you guys. I Matt Darby, Sean Williams. But you can give me, hey, you, hey, yeah. we we can do a show just on safeties at UCLA I, alone. I know. Man. I know. So. So so you, watch this though. Yeah. You're talking about it was a it was a person before him. Doctor Death was before Kenny Easley. That's so, right. So, so, yeah, so, yeah. But, but he but he was just so radical. He kind of got pushed to the side. I was mm -hmm. more like him than actually Kenny Easley. Um, yeah, you're about Jerry Robinson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, you're talking about, you're talking about uh, Jerry Robinson. No, Jerry, Jerry Robinson. Robinson. 
No. Um, Oscar, okay. Ask Oscar. So uh, Oscar. Oh, Edwards, oh. So, 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 so Oscar, Edwards, Oscar, Edwards, right. Oscar Edwards was the safety before Kenny Easley, who set the mm. team. But he came through through that militant time. So he, okay. you know, he got he got scratched off the board, and you, and you know how Donahue and how UCLA was if you was a kid, but Oscar Edwards actually was the OG. Mm. You know, um, Kenny Easley came in and just turned this whole thing out, but you know, the the tradition started with Oscar Edwards. Wow. And, and but when you go back to thinking safety tradition, you know, I came there as a receiver. And I, I was a midterm graduate, um, left high school early, came in thinking I was going to be the next receiver. Um, JoJo Tanzel and, and um, all those dudes, Doki Williams, they were seniors. So I thought, hey, man, this is an opportunity to play. Um, everybody in the country was recruiting me as a defensive back. And, um, and I was like, uh. And I remember, I remember when I got my first letter. And it was from Vegas, and and the best player in the in in California was um, was Jones, a running back from Long Beach Poly, mm-hmm. and his dad was controlling his um, recruiting, and but he was trying to recruit and bring a team together. So we, they was gonna put a whole bunch of kids from LA and take us to Vegas, mm-hmm. and. Um, so my first recruiting trip was actually, I went to Las Vegas. I went to Las Vegas and, um, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah. So Vegas in the early 80s. I went to Las Vegas and I was, in Jones had already committed to it. So the dad, okay. they kind of hired the dad to go back to the inner city and recruit kids. And, 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 and recruiting was different back then and how it is um now i mean you know money 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 was flowing when we kind of kind of get grew up and and i was like man so i stepped in vegas and they kept us at a casino i don't know why they did that and we all underage and we and because of the time that i came out because i was a midterm graduate i was being recruited by these schools doing basketball time. Okay. So, and UNLV back then, they basketball was yeah. <laughs> really good, yeah. Was, so I met, every time that I went to the schools, I met all the money people because the money people come out for basketball yeah. back then, especially like here on the West Coast. And man, it was like just flowing you know, rules and whatever. Rules were different back then. And they was pretty much kind of almost like signing bonus, man, to, to come to school. And and I was like, no, nah, I can't do that. I can't do that. Because all the other schools was talking about football. And the only thing that my grandmother really, really wanted from this whole journey was for me to graduate and get an education. Mm-hmm. And and I got a, I got a funny story to tell you down the road but it was all about education and i'm telling my grandmama you know she she worked she's she's you know she's a, a assistant at a hospitals and in these um convalescent homes cleaning up and my dad and my grandfather you know he alcohol hard working dude but he also he was a deacon of the church and also ran the pool hall still don't <laughs> understand that one right there still don't understand that one how can you be the how can you be the senior deacon and run in the pool hall? That's called a neighborhood dichotomy, man. That's a neighborhood dichotomy. Uh, and you know, <laughs> and he, he, he was a dude that can fix a house. I mean, you know, yeah. from, build a house from scratch. But, but doing this whole process, man, it, it, was, it was a true journey of, like, where did I want to go? You know, Washington was good at that time. Yeah. Um, they, they was recruiting hard. So I was going to be a West Coast dude. I was going to be, at that time, was a Pac-10. I was going to be a Pac-10 dude. It was just a matter of what team I wanted to play for in the Pac-10. And, yeah. um, and as much as we always talk about Terry Donahue on my recruiting process, and this is when I thought, I mean, 
thought the world of Terry, and you never would think that he would do this. Um, you know how you used to have the home visits? Yeah. And I was scheduled, because everybody knew they thought I was going to go with David Fulcher and uh, Aaron Cox to uh, Arizona State. So Arizona State, Washington. Now, we in Watts now. You got to understand. I got Arizona State, Washington, sitting outside the house. I don't know how Coach Don. it wasn't his time to come visit, you know. Coach Donahue and Ted Williams, and this is how I know they got, they had, they had, they had a great tie-in to, to the community. Coach Washington, I mean, Coach, Coach T, uh, Williams, running back coach at the time, yeah. who was my recruiting guy, and Terry Donahue. So I got all three head coaches in Watts at my front door on 95-17 Anzac. <laughs> all three coaches sitting outside waiting to talk to my, my grandma. And my grandma, all she cared about, she said, who paying for college? She said, That's you all she cares about. Like said, because I can't afford it. I was like, no, grandma, because we ain't never know nothing about, I wasn't even thinking about going to college. He was like, who going to pay for it? I say, them dudes outside, they going to pay for you to go to school? I said, yes, grandma. She say, where do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't care about you. She's trying to get me out of here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> My grandfather didn't have nothing to do with it. He didn't even show up at none of the meetings. <laughs> You know, and um, so I was supposed to be meeting Arizona State, which that was my original. Me and James Pringle was talking about going to Arizona State together. Mm -hmm. And we, um, so Arizona State was coming to meet my grandma. And bro, gangster style, Coach Donahue and Ted Williams comes to the house, get out the car and just walk up like, Walk through the gate, do wow. you know? And it was like it, when you're in the neighborhood, you know, I was a big thing, so you know, it's the streets are crowded, like I like I'm about to sign, right? Yeah, yeah. And they walk up, knock on the door. Ted Williams, hey, you know, I hey, um, Coach Donahue, want to talk to you? I'm like, man, you, you, we ain't scheduled no visit. You know, you got to go to, through the school or something, right? Yeah. Hey, but we need to talk to you. We need to, we need to talk to you today. Uh, we, we heard that you're going to sign with Arizona staff. I say, I ain't signing with nobody. So, actually, they, they, they bum rushed my house. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we sitting, on, we sitting on the couch with all the plastic, you know. And you, know you know how the, 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 the country oh, goes down with that plastic. Like, everybody got jury curls and don't want to mess up the, the, uh, the back of the couch. So, so we got the we got the uh they don't want the soul to go. Yeah. And, and my grandma like, like, who is this white man? What do you think he's doing? <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. And Coach Donahue is the only coach that talked about, and he had his spill. Mm -hmm. He had his spill. He's the only coach that day that talked about me graduating. He's the only coach that talked about figuring out how to make that transition from L.A. Jordan the City to be able to give me academic help to make sure that I'm successful at UCLA. He's the only coach. Only yeah. coach throughout my entire recruiting time talked about the importance of the education. Yeah. Because all my grandmother was like, I need you to get education so you can get a job so I don't have to take care of you. Yeah. But I knew her end game, and she just tried to get me out of the streets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's get, you know, so that's, that's, that's what it was. The winning, the, the winning draw is that Coach Donahue wooed my grandmother in making her believe that I can get an education at UCLA. And, I, and, he, and he said, you ain't going to get an education. You probably play football, and you probably be gone in three years at these other schools and then you'll never go back to graduate. And mm -hmm. then he would say, I'll get you private tutoring your first year, because I was a midterm graduate, you know, to get you ready and prepared to compete at UCLA on and off the field. 
Yeah. And that's how I ended up in Westwood. That's good stuff. Well, we're going to take another break. And when we come back, we're going to really talk about that safety tradition and get back to, you know, I, I'm always curious and fascinated. I know you had some overlap with Don Rogers. You played with Eric Turner. You know Ken Easley. I, we really have to talk about that because that's, that's, that's fascinating. So we'll take a short break and we'll be right back. All right. Hi, I'm Mike Gardner, founder of Thin Energy, the wellness energy that delivers each and every time. In six weeks that I've been taking Thin Energy, I feel fantastic. I lost seven pounds in the first week. You just squeeze it in, you take a shot, and you're done. Go get your joints, get you hyped, and get you ready. I feel great. Jump on, try Thin Energy. Drink it, live it. Many people are looking for natural alternatives to help ease their aches and pains. Begin stopping the pain with the help of Pain Stopper. Formulated by healthcare providers, Pain Stopper helps alleviate a variety of physical ailments so you can get back to doing what you love. Our products are triple independently lab tested to ensure the highest quality hemp available. Visit PainStopCBD.com for more information. Pain Stopper, because why manage pain when you can stop it? We're back with chopping it up with Buck, my man J Dub again. And man, it's, it's so many ways we can go. But I think when we come back, there's one thing I want to tell you, and I remember this story vividly before you talk about the safety that UCLA. I had a red truck. <laughs> you know, you were you were coming back in the off season, but I remember we talked about it because my aunt lived at 109th ninth place. Yeah. Right? So she, like I said, right by LA Southwest College. You said, bruh. You better go down this way, that way, <laughs> this way to get to your aunt's house. Because you're driving that red truck, bro. You and you going through the crip neighborhood. You just trying to get no. off the freeway. You was trying to get off the freeway and, and ride through Hoover Crips and all that. And I'm like, bro, you going? You man, you got to go down a little bit. Yeah, you I, and Mar you and Marcus Patton told me like you got to go this way and that. I'm like, oh man, why? Well, and, and when I got to beautiful street nobody that you know that was the old some of the older heads that live there nobody no no problem on that street crazy yeah, yeah. well you know tell me a little bit about the, the safety position for you and what it meant to watch guys like ken easley don rod oscar edwards you know you talked yeah. about earlier these guys were, were just guys that were great players in their own right and the young pup like me, Eric Turner, was out there with you. Tell us a little yeah, bit about Bobby as well. Yeah, yeah, great safety tradition out of at UCLA. So um, the the real story is that man, I I, um, I had never played safety before. Mm -hmm. um, in my recruiting class, Dennis Price from Long Beach Poly, he was one of the top recruits. Um, was a safety. Chucky Miller was the corner, and um, both of those guys signed with UCLA. Paco Craig was supposed to come in from Riverside. He was a corner. I mean, I, 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 our class was stacked, you know, with, yeah. with dudes um, that were supposed to come in and take over from guys that was already leaving. Um, didn't really know. I knew about the USC, um, and, and true, true to this, I knew about the, the culture of SC. You know, I knew about Joey Brown. I knew about yeah. Ronnie Lott, who played corner. I knew about Dennis Smith. Uh, and, and so on. We're talking about a, a rich history of, of DBs that it was at SC. Um, but I didn't know about Kenny Easley. Didn't know about Oscar Edwards. And then, you know, Don Rogers. Them dudes um, was not on my radar because, you know, SC was like, when you say UCLA was to what, 13 to 15 miles, SC was like right down the 110. Meaning mm -hmm. that, you know, you get on Manchester, get off on, um, it, it's, it's called uh, Martin Luther King, but it was called Santa Barbara back then. Santa Barbara uh, Exposition, you right at that seat. You know, uh, dry down Figueroa, where all the money was made on Figueroa. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> or you come straight down Figueroa. You know, 92nd to Figueroa, you right at that seat. Hey, I got to say this too. The the thing is, people that aren't from LA, yeah. laugh because you have to explain to people how to get places. <laughs> one on one to the one ten. <laughs> <to X. laughs> I love it. It's just, it's just that if you if you can, I 
<laughs> I had two homeboys lose their life. Yeah. Made the wrong turn. Mm -hmm. Got caught up in a neighborhood. Two, I mean, just got caught up in that alone. So that's when I learned the streets. Uh, stay off the freeways and the highways because I used to ride my bicycle everywhere when I was little. And um, so I had to learn that that whole thing. And I knew where to be, where not to be. And I was kind of like a white rag. I was not really a blue rag or red rag. I was all about my money. I mean, I've always been like that with you. And you know how I am. I'm, I can I put it together. And getting back to UCLA and the tradition, didn't know much about it. Like I just told you, I knew about the yeah. USC tradition of DBs. But when I stepped on campus and, um, and I'm playing DB, and this is a couple dudes like Lupe Sanchez was cold, like good feet, everything played corner. And I thought I was going to come. I was a cover corner in high school, shut down corner. And I'm 6'1", six, six 175 pounds at the time. So Dennis, Smith, Dennis Price, who was coming in with me, that's part of our recruiting class. So it was supposed to be Chucky Miller, me on one side, Dennis Price, and whoever they, they throw in after that, you know. Um, so I was like, cool, we about to go take this thing out and take it to the next level, right? Yeah. And then we got there, and they looked at us, and not knowing they had a plan for us to play DB, at least me, they gave me 10 days on offense, 10 days on, on defense. They, that's what Donahue told me when he recruited me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we started spring ball. I got one day on offense. <laughs> and then they Homer, moved you Homer, Smith, Homer Smith says, James, you know, <laughs> at, at, at training table in spring, he says, you know, and I've been practicing all, like, all season, getting there, catching deep balls. He said, you run the nine real well. <laughs> but the passing tree has other leaves. <laughs> you know how home it's for us, right? I do. I he know. Said, it has other leaves. <laughs> you don't do those that well. <laughs> I'm like, what? Oh, man. Hey, like, passing tree? What? He's like, yes. You know, the passing tree, one through nine. I was like, okay, understood the passing tree. My coach taught me about the passing tree as a defensive back, you know. He says, but, you know, you're too choppy. You know, you're like a broken leaf. I mean, you know how Homer is. I know how Homer is, yeah. yeah. You're like a broken leaf when you run, you're out. You gotta, you just so, gotta so, roll so, into so it. So good, so fine. <laughs> You know he was talking over my head though, right? Yeah, I so know. I got one day on offense, and I've been a defensive back ever since. Yeah. And I thought um, Lupe Sanchez was the one corner. I ha I hadn't seen Chucky Chucky Miller play yet. Ron Pitts was there, so I'm like, you know, um, Crawford was there. Lionel Crawford was there. I was like, I can start at corner my freshman year. That's the reason why I went to. Um, you know, UCLA, I went there to play. I went there to play three years and get to the pros. That, that, was, that was the game plan. Yep. So I get there, and um, they redshirt our entire class. Oh, that's right. Yeah, all of you guys. That was the first time, that's the first time that they redshirted, like, a whole group, except um, Chucky Miller. Because Chucky had sweet feet. I mean, he probably mm -hmm. had the best feet that I've ever seen next to Lupe Sanchez. And he deserved it, but he should have stayed with us. He probably would have been better. But, <laughs> uh, and but, then Chucky taught, Chucky taught D. Hen. Yeah, taught, taught D. Yeah, he taught us a lot. Girl, so, yeah. But getting back to the safety component, uh, it was between me and Dennis, who was they, they were going to choose to be a safety. Um, I started gaining a little weight. And then I had an edge to myself uh, that Tom Hayes was like, hey, I think we're going to switch you around. We're going to put Dennis at corner, and then we're going to make you a safety. I said, I never played safety. I said, you know, because all the safeties prior to me was 200 pounds, six. You know, Kenny Easley was like in college now. Yeah. Kenny Easley was two, 210, 6'3". 
Don Rogers was 220, 6'2. Now, then how much did you overlap with Don at all? I yeah, know. yeah, that's what I'm about to tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Don was, a, Don was a senior my freshman year, like kind of how okay. you came in. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I came in here early to play, you know? And they were like, uh, no, we're going to put you at safety so you can learn this position. I'm like, learn the position? So check this out. So Tom Hayes, because I'm, I'm big on film watching. I was like that in high school. Uh, that's one thing Coach Washington taught me. He, I mean, we used to go out and recruit yeah. in high school, and Coach Washington give you a clipboard. He, he would have about four or five players. He'd give you a clipboard, and he'd have you taking notes mm. in high school. Like, that, that's how we did our recruiting. Yeah, you, you're learning the game. Yeah. yeah exactly. so, so I became a student of the game. So I think Coach Hayes understood that piece. He said, we're going to put you at safety. You need to watch this, this role of film. This is how we play safety at UCLA. I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever, man. You know, I turn on the tape, man. There's only four plays on the tape. Four plays, boss. <laughs> We're talking about UCLA history. Yeah. Four plays on the tape. The first play... Kenny Easley playing against, I think, Arkansas. Kenny Easley comes down the hill. They're running that, that option. Yeah. Kenny Easley blows up the fullback, goes through the quarterback, make the quarterback pitch the ball to the tailback, hits the tailback. <laughs> Causes the fumble and picks up the fumble. That was the front play one. Yeah. Okay. The next play on the tape. Don Rogers coming off the hash and cover two. And folds somebody like a suitcase off the hash and cover two. He trying to ram the fade. We go back to Kenny Easley. They're playing man free. Kenny Easley in the middle of the field. Dude throws a fade route. Kenny Easley comes from the middle of the field and snatches the ball with one hand. I've seen that play. Wait, no, wait. Snatches yeah. the ball with one hand, yes. plants his foot, and takes it to the house. Yeah, I've seen that play. Okay, wait. <laughs> Don Rogers in the Rose Bowl. Against Michigan. Against Michigan. I know this play well. <laughs> wait. Crunches. Offensive. Offenders. Crunch. Tape goes dead. So I go to back to Tom Hayes. I say, so what, what What you want me to do with this? He says, if you want to play safety, you got to play like that. Mm. Okay, you got to understand, I'm 6'1", 175 pounds. These dudes, who, whatever level they was at, I was like, that was the first time that I, I felt like I was in the truck with my grandfather. That was the first time <laughs> I was like, <laughs> bruh. I was like, what let, let, me, let me ask you this. Now, I, it was said that sometimes Don, they wouldn't let him practice live. He would hit so hard. I, I don't, was yeah, that true? It was. Is that, um, well, both of them, actually. Yeah. I mean, I mean Kenny was older than us. But. Yeah, yeah. Kenny, they would kick Kenny out of practice. Wow. Um, because what Kenny taught me, and it was so funny because they were both mentors because he used to mentor Don Rogers, mm -hmm. which I got the overspill of it. He says, the tempo is set by the defense. Practice mm. tempo is set by the defense. It's not set by the offense. You being an offensive player don't agree with that. but <laughs> I know what you're saying defense. when you say that. Yeah, yeah. He says, there's days when you say who can run across the middle. Mm -hmm. There's days when you 
says, okay, you, need, you guys need to work on the fade today. That's how Kenny Easy controlled the practice. Yeah. Because you know how t Tom Hayes, we have to run to the football all the time. Exactly. It, it was like, you ball. cannot. Everybody to the ball. Yeah. If you're not running to the football, you're not playing on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a culture that he had created. But Kenny just took it to, the, to a whole nother level. And he, he, and he was not Donahue's favorite, favorite person. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. talked bad about Donahue. He said, listen to Tom, you'll be okay. But Donahue, you don't trust. And, mm -hmm. I'm, and so he instilled that in me and Don. You know, Don Rogers, he would just blow up practices and they'd be like, you know what, just leave the practice. James, I'm, I'm going to say, hey, I, I watched that tape that you're talking about, the Rose Bowl game. And it was, it's that old footage, the real, the real. Yeah, yeah. That quarterback so hard, I could hear it, and it was yeah. no down. Yeah. I mean, it, like the life went out that dude when Crunch. he hit. And, and it's, it's eliminated, eliminated quarterbacks running down the line with us. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so all those things, because I was faster than both of them. I was quick. Mm -hmm. I was more elusive and, you know, if I didn't blow out my knee my senior year, but besides that, but before that, I had led the team in interceptions and tackles my first two years. Um, and because I tried to pattern myself, I just wasn't big, I wasn't my girth. I didn't have that man strength until I got to the league. And, um, but that's where I learned how to play safety. Just watching their tape. I will watch game tape, but I watch more tape of Kenny Easley and Don Rogers to learn and understand how to play safety. I was already a student of the game. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, um, and, and you know, I had a, a great career, but then they brought a big old dude by the name of E.T. <laughs> uh, my senior year, his freshman year, um, he was coming in to replace me or we were supposed to play a tantrum. He was supposed to be the strong safety at the time. Then I was going to be the free safety my senior year. But then when I hurt my knee, he moved back to safety. He moved back to free safety. Yeah. And he was a mixture of Don Rogers and Kenny. He was a hybrid of him, yeah. all three of us, because he had speed. He had size. He was strong. He, he spent a lot of time in the weight room. Yeah. And he... He had the confidence as a freshman. Oh man! You know, well, we our freshman class was probably similar. Similar. Yeah, yeah exactly. Red shirt. Yeah. Those guys had to, but yeah. it was Brian Jones. Yeah. Uh, you know, Et Reggie Moore. Yeah. Matt Darby. Yeah. Yeah. Matt. Well, Matt was a year behind us. Yes. But, but they are. It was interesting that group, man. We we came in like like y'all. Like we're gonna we gonna take this. Is a, this was fun to do, and you still <laughs> yeah. playing, but. But like you say, you got when you got dudes that's in front of you that has already established themselves, and then and then my boy Alan Dow kind of came into his mm -hmm. own a little yeah. later. I mean, you could not play. We used to call ourselves the police. You could <laughs> not play in our secondary if you could not cover and you could not hit. It. If yeah. you was if you was afraid to do either one, you can line us up across the board and we can play man to man with anybody. You know. And that's because, you know, in the Pac-12, in the Pac-10 at that time, it was all error, you know, boom, boom, yeah. boom. And they just passing the ball. So you have to be able to cover because you'd be one-on-one -on -one every once in a while. But then if you played safety, you could not be afraid to put your nose inside and, and, and hit that, that running back at the line of scrimmage. And yeah. that's where Rutledge, that's where Craig Rutledge was one of those dudes where he lost it because he, his feet wasn't fast enough to get back there in that secondary and cover, that's the only thing. But when you talk about a safety, like if he was a rover in the box, if he would have went to Arizona State, he'd have been been a monster. And that A State team you're talking about, they won the the uh, Pac-12 championship, went to the Rose Bowl. Exactly. Here, but you know, one of the things you bring up is getting on the yard. Before I got there, the reason I came is because you guys were winning Rose Bowls. You, you had you were of the Fiesta Bowl against the Miami. Happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like and you know how Miami guys are. They talk a lot of right. trash. Yeah, but, 
Hey, they try once, to, once you ball against them, hey, and, you, hey, and they give you fact it, and The fact is, I remember our freshman year, um, you know how they do that party at the yeah. – at the, they get together and they supposed to be so so hard. And um, I go on Miami's bus. Um, once we left the Fiesta Bowl, this is before the game. And I go on their bus. And this is this is how I ended up in Dallas. I go on that bus, and and you know they trying to act like they hard. And what I learned is that if you have the respect of the top dude, which was Bangs mm-hmm. at the time, Toma uh, Bangs, Toma Bangs, yeah. Um, me and him, for some reason, we jail like that, and, and we was doing something. But me and him was like this. But I didn't know he was more gangster. Like he's my enemy gangster, right? <laughs> so I go on the bus and I'm just trying to get to him to say, hey boss, where you going? Where you hanging out? You know how I do it. And I'm a freshman, because I mean I ain't really trying to hang out with these dudes. I'm just that's what we're supposed to be camaraderie rise, right? And uh, so I get on the bus, I'm trying to get the bangs in the back. And these and, and Miami dudes, and Jimmy happens to be on the bus that same bus. And um, he didn't say nothing. He just wanted to see what. So I'm like, hey, Bangs, what you doing tonight? Blah, blah, blah. Where y'all going? Da, da, da. And then it was some other dudes on the bus saying, bro, you know, and you know, that's Miami style. Bro, what you doing on the bus? What you doing on our bus? Like that. I was like, bro, I'm talking. And you know how I am. Bro, ain't nobody talking to you. <laughs> Bangs, what you doing tonight, man? And he didn't say nothing. Then somebody jumped in my face. I said, besides, I said, be, and I said this on the bus. I said, besides the defensive linemen, if y'all don't all jump me at one time, I will whoop everybody's ass on this bus. Except by <laughs> and, uh, and somebody jumped in my face and Baines jumped up. And this is how I know how he might not have been the superstar that, Everybody thought he was, but this is how real he was. He said, hey, one-on-one, let's see what he can do. But if anybody jump in, y'all going to deal with me. Mm. After he said that, I still can call Melvin Bratton, Baines. I can call all them dudes to this day right now. If you call Mel, it like we've been brothers and yeah. throughout the whole piece. Just because of that one incident as a freshman, well, that's really cool because if you f- fast forward that, when y'all were coming back in the off season, all those guys were coming out to UCLA to work out. But it's, I mean, they told me the story. I don't know how many times about how crazy you were. Yeah. And the funny piece is that they've been my homies. Yeah. From that day on, from my freshman year. And then I got in the game and turned the game out. That was, and that was before. And I turned the game out. And then we was real like that. It, so, 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 Dub, you said something interesting. You said take on the guy that's the biggest, and I and I think uh, the one that you know everybody looks at. And I that was my mentality when I stepped on on UCLA. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Like, I'm gonna be quiet, but I'm coming because you know, a dude, yeah. Charles Arbuckle. Y'all probably thought I was a white boy. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna show you. I thought you were. Hey, who, who mama named him Charles and his last name Arbuckle? What from Texas? You know, so, it's Johnson, Watson, or, you know, Pookie, <laughs> Bebe, Nook Nook, something. You ain't even have a nickname. <laughs> well, that's how Buck came about. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, the thing is, I, I tell people all the time, the tradition that we had, and you said it earlier, so many guys that have gone on and, and played at the next level. You got a chance to win two Super Bowls with the Cowboys. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the, the, the story of getting there was ironic because it was a plan B. I was a plan B dude that um, – you know, I thought I was going to go to the Raiders. I always wanted to play for the Raiders. Lester <laughs> Hayes was my favorite player um, from Texas as well. Um, so I wanted to go play for the Raiders. And I finally got a chance to get healthy. So I ran like a 4-4-5 four, four, for them. And, you know, Raiders was always about speed. So, and, you know, we didn't have cell phones back then. So uh, me, and my, me and my ex, me and my ex, we um, end up going to – we was going on a vacation after all it was over. It was my wife at the time. And um, we go on um, a, a trip 
to um, to NASA, and we're in the Bahamas chilling. So then we flying back, and I'm thinking I'm a Raider. Plan B, I didn't went, I didn't did all my workouts, and everything. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna take a vacation, and um, so we fly through Dallas, man. And um, so we were waiting for our, 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 our layover, our, our lap, our flight to go back to California. So we fly to um, Dallas from Florida, American Airlines. Dallas Cowboys and the owner is sponsored. That was our team charter. And um, I get there, man, and they tell me I can't get on the plane in um, Dallas to go home. And I'm like, what you mean? I haven't got my ticket, da da da. And um, we end up <laughs> going, sitting there. I'm mad, you know, and you know me, I'm hot too. Like, what uh-huh. you mean I can't get on the flight? So sh- shortly thereafter, management from the Dallas Cowboys, cheerleaders coming to to the thing, to the airport, and they pick pick me up. And I'm like, and I did a workout for Dallas, but it was like cold, windy. You know, mm-hmm. I still did the workout, but I didn't think think of nothing about it. So they take me back to the Dallas facility, man. And uh, next thing you know, I'm sitting in front of Jimmy Johnson. Say, have you talked to your agent yet? You know, we ain't got cell phones back then. So I was like, no. He says, um, well, we're in the process of negotiating your deal right now. I said, negotiate, and I always wanted to play. You got to understand, I grew up, I, was a, I didn't grow up as a Raider fan because I wasn't a football fan, but when I became a football fan, mm-hmm. I was a Lester Hayes fan, and I loved the Raiders. And, and I said, hell no, y'all was 1-15. <laughs> <laughs> you want to come here? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He like, uh, he, he laughed. He said, yeah. He said it was a tough year last year, but we're trying to, we trying to build a um, Super Bowl contender. And he said, I'm trying to get certain kind of guys in this locker room. This is what he said. I'm trying to get certain kind of guys in my locker room. And you, you're that guy. You're, you're that kind of guy that I need to kind of come in here and shake it up. I was like, I said, do you? He said, he, and then he started telling me the story about the bus. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> he he went like, back to the bus <laughs> yeah, he said, you remember you getting on the bus your freshman year? Your rest your freshman year? I said, yeah. I was trying to see what Baines was doing. He said, yeah, I was sitting in the front seat. He says, like I say, I want kind of guys like you and I'm gonna put some guys like you on this team. And, you know, and I want to always, cause I love playing with Ken Norton. Ken Norton was there. Not, not so much Troy Aikman at the time. I mean, because I only played one year with Troy. So it was like, um, but Ken Norton was my dude. You know, we played together. He was a signal caller for the front, and I was a signal caller. So I, it, it was interesting for me. And um, ended up being there, man. And they had negotiate. They was negotiating the deal already. It was just a matter if I wanted to agree to the terms. And that's how I got to Dallas. It, it wasn't even like I was planning on. I, I thought I was signed, sealed, delivered, and going to wear number 37 for, for the Raiders and be, mm. you know, Lester Hayes. You know what I'm saying? And um, so we got there, and this dude said in the meeting, he said, I promise you, if you come here and sign with us, we'll be in the Super Bowl in two to three years. Mm. Lo and behold, Super Bowl 27, I'm in our locker room at the Rose Bowl, playing in the Rose Bowl. Yeah, that's right. I think it was two two years later, two two year ninety ninety three ninety two ninety three, two years later, man, we playing our first Super Bowl at the Rose Bowl. I have the first turnover in the Rose Bowl, and it was all we had nine turnovers after that. And I and I and I left the, that that game. I'm gonna be honest, but the Super Bowl twenty seven. I left that game so upset. We won the Super Bowl and I'm mad, right? <laughs> and Ken Norton like, dude, what you mad at? You always angry. What you mad at? I said, man, I had the first turnover in the game, man. But we had nine turnovers after that. We had eight turnovers after that and set a Super Bowl record. I said, they don't even remember my turnover. I said, <laughs> I told Ken, I told Ken, 
And I said, Ken, if I ever make it back to the Super Bowl, if I ever make it back to the Super Bowl, they'll never forgive me. Mm. And that was Super Bowl 28. Yeah. Yeah, Emmitt got the MVP, but I made the plays to give him the ball. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you know, you ended up with a, a, a turnover, forced turnover, an interception return for a touchdown, some major plays in that game in Super Bowl 28 that really helped catapult you guys. You know, I'm, Doug, you, you, you know, we talk about all the, the, the history of football. I know you, you work with your organization, Shelter 37. Tell us a little bit about that, because I, I think that's an interesting piece. I know you went back to UCLA, worked there, campus, did some things. But Shelter 37 is always interesting. I love to hear and let the people know more about that as well. Yeah, shelter37.org, you can learn about everything that I do, man. Um, the thing about Shelter 37 was created for um, second chance opportunities for people because I was that kid. I mean, growing up, you know, we all try to find a, um, a opportunity, how we give back for all the blessings. And this is where Coach Washington really instilled in me. You got to come back to the community and give back. And Shelter 37 is, you know, of my own heart. You know, we here in L.A., man, I've been, Shelter 37 has been in existence for almost over um, 25, 25 years. Uh, been feeding families, giving out toys, mentoring, teaching. Um, you know, Shelter 37 has helped you know, the homeless has helped the needy. Um, it's just something if you if you look up my makeup, I'm not I'm not really a big social media guy. I'm not a big guy that's all talk about what I do. But everything that I've done in Shelter 37 and the lives that I've changed. I, I haven't changed millions of lives yet, but I guarantee you it's in the tens of thousands of people that I've affected um, over the past 25 years being able to create work programs like with Youth Bill. We've had um, continuation schools um, that we, we had started at one point in time. Um, everything that I wake up every day, Buck, and this is since I you know, walked away from the game, the only thing that I try to do is impact one person every day that I wake up. But Shelter 37 has given me the opportunity to impact thousands of people. Yeah. Uh, you know, for the past 20 years, we, we feed, and, and I'm not talking about, we pass out turkeys, but we give them the whole meal. Bowl. Mm, I mean, they gotcha. take bags of groceries away with a turkey for, for the past 20 years. Been doing it for 20 years, but um, toy drives and toys and working with the sheriff departments here in different departments where kids, I mean, blocks lined up thousands and thousands of families. They would have just, you know, I've worked with the Pico Rivera program. I've worked with Goals for Life, where I went into the, the, the juvenile hall systems mm -hmm. and taught a curriculum. Um, matter of fact, four different organizations, four different halls where I've actually taught um, kids life living skills so that in teaching them how to graduate before they get out of of the juvenile system yeah and I, I mean with the things that I've done with UCLA I had a graduation rate of 90 plus percent of every kid that I mentored at UCLA the ones that didn't graduate they went to the pros and, and, that's a guy, and that's a guy that what, wasn't even thinking about college, helping guys yeah, we, get through college. <laughs> you know what, Buck? It is so funny because I, and I said I wasn't thinking about college, but before I left UCLA, I had my BA, right? Yeah. And then the day that I decided to quit playing football, I enrolled in school and went back and got my master's degree. Mm -hmm. and, and it was just to have it on the shelf, you know, yeah. just to say check the box. Um, but the cool piece about that in that whole sense is how my education and my ex-wife's education has really poured into our kids. You know, I had a kid when I was in high school, so she ended up 
she grew up in Watts, the whole bit, but she ended up, she's a school teacher. She ended up not only having a BA, but she has a master's degree. Mm -hmm. My other son, my oldest son graduated from USC, uh, Marshall School of Business. He has his BA. Um, my youngest son has his BA from Laverne, and now he's in Florida working on graduate school. And then my baby girl, who won the national championship um, last year, she's at, U, 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 at UCLA, and pretty much she's almost done with school. Yeah, going into her junior year, and it's it's just been a it's just been an amazing ride, boss. That's Ken, Kensley Washington. Well, you know what? What we're gonna do, Doug? We could do this all day. You and I'll get on, and we'll when yeah. I come out west, or you come this way, we get together. Yeah. It's just like it's a nonstop. And then yeah. I'm gonna have you back. I mean, yes. this is good stuff. This is this is what exactly what I was telling you a few years ago. I wanted to do, and, and part of it too is I want to tell you thank you because as much as we battled on the field, I also saw the example of you going to class, getting your education, and you know some of the the, the hard exterior. I knew what it was because we all have kind of been around that. But I also knew uh, if somebody, if you like somebody, you were gonna be with them. You were gonna be with them. So. I want to thank you, man, again, for coming coming on Chopping It Up with Buck. We're going to have you on again, definitely. And we're going to get into more of the Dallas Cowboy era because that part, I know <laughs> stories. Hey, and Buck, I wanna... <laughs> Buck, Buck. It's like, if you ain't party, <laughs> bro, that's, that's a whole nother segment, but we just, we're just going to hey. do a Dallas – we're just gonna do a Dallas segment, man. You know what, man? I'm gonna have. Hey, we might have you on just just to have segments like the Dallas yeah. segment. Yeah, we're gonna do a Dallas segment, man. <laughs> yeah. uh, best time hey. of my life. Best yeah. time. Of my life, bro. Well, hey, man, I appreciate it. You yeah. stay safe out there, in Cali, and uh, when I come out there, you know we're getting together, and then <laughs> this way for sure, we, we got to do it. Hey, keep up the good work, man. I'm very proud of you, bro. <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mike Gardner, founder of Thin Energy, the wellness energy that delivers each and every time. In six weeks that I've been taking Thin Energy, I feel fantastic. I lost seven pounds in the first week. You just squeeze it in, you take a shot, and you're done. You get your joints, get you hype, get you ready. I feel great. Jump on, try Thin Energy. Drink it, live it. Many people are looking for natural alternatives to help ease their aches and pains. Begin stopping the pain with the help of Pain Stopper. Formulated by healthcare providers, Pain Stopper helps alleviate a variety of physical ailments so you can get back to doing what you love. Our products are triple independently lab tested to ensure the highest quality hemp available. Visit PainStopCBD.com for more information. Pain Stopper, because why manage pain when you can stop it? At Heslip Wealth Advisors, our goal is to help small businesses develop quality retirement plans for their employees through our Lunch and Learn seminars. We provide lunch and learning tools to help your company succeed and unmatched customer service. 